When I was a child, my mother uh, took me and two of my older sisters, Lisa and Val, and, and uh, took us, uh, she was looking for an apartment for us, and so she uh, took us to this place. We walked into the leasing office, and, and uh, the woman greeted us and began to talk to us about the complex and showed us an apartment, and not long after that, we were moving in, and uh, her name was Carolyn. Her husband's name was Alan, and they lived in uh, the complex as well, very close to us. And before I knew it, we were like family. I mean, we were always at their house playing, and uh, they would feed us and, and, and do things like that. In the summer, uh, we would come to call him Uncle Alan. He would take us to Pizza Hut in the summer. And we would ride in the back of his pickup back then. You could do that. Where you could ride in the back of a pickup, driving down the interstate, going 70 miles per hour. Like, who does that now? You're going to get pulled over if you do that now, right? We thought it was fun, you know? Um, I, didn't ask, I didn't ask any questions at all. I, I, all I knew is, man, for whatever reason, these folks really love our family. They really love us. And to this day, I am certain that I was her favorite. Like she, I mean, I, I was her boy. She used to call me KP. My name's Kenneth Preston. So she would call me KP all the time. That was over 40 years ago. And there's a picture of Uncle Alan. Uh, so that's Uncle Alan. Um, and then those, that's me as a little baby or a little boy. My sister Lisa right next to me and Val behind me. So we're, so Val is 53, Lisa's 52, I'm 51. Uh, when I was in Atlanta for the discipleship conference, Uncle Alan and I had some time together. Uh, he actually let me buy him dinner, and he was taking me back to the train station. I was going to hop on a train and meet Sam uh, downtown so we could head uh, to the conference. But Auntie Carolyn went to be with the Lord some years ago, uh, but she was a sweet woman. He told me, I didn't know this, but he told me when we were together, he said that um, they couldn't have children together. And so when she saw this woman walking into the leasing office that day with three little kids, she took it as a gift from God. That's how she took it. And, and I tell you what, she treated us as if we were her children. From the day she met our family until she passed, she loved us. My whole point behind all this, brothers and sisters, is that kindness goes a very long way. You'd be amazed what kindness can do and will do to people when you're just kind to them. Um, again, my mother, as a child, I, I didn't, I, I knew things were hard, but, but I tell you what, Auntie Carolyn, Uncle Alan, they would have known just how hard things were for a single mom with three kids. And the kindness they showed us, I'll never forget. But keeping the promise that he made to Jonathan in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David was seeking to show kindness to the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. He learns that Jonathan had a surviving son named Mephibosheth, and the kindness that David would show Jonathan's surviving son paints for us one of the clearest and most beautiful pictures of grace in the Word of God. From that, we started looking at evangelism simplified because Mephibosheth in this narrative pictures a lost person estranged from God, and then we see how they are reconciled to him. It's a beautiful thing. But listen, to evangelize, as much as we need to be sound with the gospel, as much as we need to be obedient to preach it, we also have to be kind. Like we have to present the gospel in a kind way. I promise you, there are people in your life, I would even say saved and unsaved, but there are people in your life who are hurting. They're hurting. Your neighbors, I promise you, they're hurting. Life is hard, right? Sometimes life hits really hard, doesn't it? You have people, you have family members, you have coworkers, you have acquaintances, where life is kicking them in the teeth. I mean, they are gasping. They're hurting. And I'm going to tell you, some kindness, the kindness of God, will go a long way in their life. And you know what God wants to do? 
He wants to use you to be his instrument of kindness to them. That's what he wants to do. We're going to talk more about that this morning. But if we're going to do that, we must keep the gospel that God has entrusted to us to preach. Being kind will definitely open doors. I mean, it, I mean the doors will just, you'd be amazed how all of a sudden, like, it'll be like a layup where you have a, a, an open door. It's clear to talk with this person about the gospel of Jesus Christ just because of the kindness of God that you've shown them. But we do have to speak when that moment comes. We have to be obedient. So we continue in 2 Samuel 9 and verse 5. We're going to build this more. Then King David sent and fetched him, that's Mephibosheth, out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. So someone has identified to David who he can show kindness to. So David sees that now. This location in Lodabar was not close to Jerusalem. But David was serious about this. He was serious about this. And listen, when you and I are serious about something, our actions are going to reflect it, right? They always do. So here's our next observation about evangelism. Evangelism calls for serious believers. It calls for serious believers. Someone once said, it is not so important to be serious as it is to be serious about important things. I agree with that. Evangelism is important. And it is something that we must be serious about. It absolutely is. And when we are, our actions will mirror David's actions. The fact that he would send to go have Mephibosheth brought back to him, a place that wasn't close, says that he was serious. I mean, he's the king of Israel. Mephibosheth offered him nothing, as we're going to see. I mean, David, I mean, his kingdom is exploding at this point. I mean, he, he doesn't have to do this, right? But he was so serious about keeping his word. He was a keeping believer. But when you're serious, what we're going to do, when we're serious about evangelism, then we're going to do what Jesus himself did. We're going to go out of our way with the gospel. We're going to go and spend a month in Africa because we're that serious about it. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast. So this is Levi who, as just now, Jesus said, follow me. And without hesitation, he obeyed. Made, it, made, a, made a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Christ, as we know, he was omniscient. He knew who was going to be at this feast. He knew that publicans and sinners were going to be at this feast. And he knew exactly what the public perception was of these folks. They were crooks. I mean, this was the lowest occupation you could hold. I mean, you were despised and loathed because everybody knew you were a cheat. Jesus actually went and sat and ate with them, knowing what it would do to his image in the eyes of some. Because he came to call sinners to repentance, he didn't isolate himself from sinners. He came for them. He ate and drank with them. As I get older, I, I, I understand more and more and more just how invaluable time is. And again, like I said, I promise you, there are people in and around your life who are hurting. They are in great pain. And to actually have you sit down with them and just have a meal 
where you encourage them and you're gracious to them and you're kind to them. And as you're listening to them talk and, and at some point you go, hey, would you mind if, if, we, if I just prayed for you right now? Then you're going to say no. <laughs> and, and, to, and for them to actually hear you from your heart, take them before the throne of grace and talk to God on their behalf. Game changer. Game changer. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. For the Son of Man is come. From where? From heaven. How about that for going out of your way? From heaven. You don't come from heaven, put on flesh, live in a fallen world, unless you're serious about reaching the loss. John 4, verses 3 and 4, speaking of Jesus, and he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. So if you were traveling from Judea to Galilee, the shortest route was to go right through Samaria. That was the shortest route. But to avoid contact with the Samaritans, uh, the Jews would intentionally take a very long route. So the Jews were serious about not going through Samaria, but guess what? Jesus was serious about going through Samaria. He was serious about it. I need you to hear this. I need to hear this. We are not serious about evangelism if we do not spend time with lost people. You are not serious about it. If, 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 you, if, if lost people are not on your calendar, you are not serious about evangelism. You can't be. How can you reach lost people if you don't spend time with them? It's not possible. It's not possible. We'll never win anyone to Christ if we avoid lost people like the Jews avoided the Samaritans. And if we're not careful as believers, we'll find ourselves doing exactly what the Jews did, where we'll go out of our way to make sure we don't come in contact with those people. With their drinking and their cussing and how they live and all of that. Ugh. Jesus sat and ate with those folks. <laughs> Based on what we're seeing here in chapter 9, here's a basic step that we can take as a fellowship today that says we're serious about evangelism. Here it is. Can we just ask God, will we ask God for opportunities to show His kindness to the lost. Can we just do that? Father, would You, for Your glory, would You give me, would You show me how I can show Your kindness to those who are estranged from You? Notice how this chapter begins. David in verse 1, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. He asked a question. And he got an answer. Yes. Anytime you ask that question, the answer is going to be yes. Like I just said, because you've got people in your life, and so do I, who are hurting, God's, I'm telling you, I can only imagine the testimonies that we'll have in this place if we would agree with God together and seek His face for opportunities to show His kindness. The testimonies that we'll have. It would be to the glory of God. It would be. Here's a critical truth, though. God will give us opportunities to show His kindness to the lost if that is what we desire. If that is the desire of your heart, fasten your seatbelt. 
God is going to give you opportunities to show his kindness to the lost. The question is, is is that what you desire? Is that your heart? And opportunities to show his kindness, listen, they come with many gospel opportunities. It's a package deal. And it will be natural, and it will be genuine, and it will be kind. Praise the Lord. So far, so simple? Evangelism simplified. That's what we're talking about. Okay, verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? So in chapter 4, in verse 4, if you remember as we read through that, it tells a story about what happened when the nurse of Mephibosheth received news that his father Jonathan and his grandfather Saul died in battle. Right? She fled. Mephibosheth fell. He becomes lame in his feet. Right? So by now, he's a man. Because verse 12 tells us that he has a son. So he's not this five-year-old boy anymore. He, he's an adult man by this time. So imagine you're Mephibosheth. I mean, this is, this is the day on your calendar that you've dreaded. I mean, you, you do not live in Jerusalem. You don't live close to Jerusalem. You have distanced yourself. Your grandfather hated David. Made his life a nightmare. Your father loved him, and he loved your father, but, but your father's gone. And it doesn't tell us if he was aware of the covenant that David made with his father, but even if he was aware of it, who's to say that David's going to honor it and keep it? You are disabled, and essentially you offer the king nothing. And then here it is. David's guards show up asking for you. You're coming with us. The king has requested your presence. (laughs) Wow, what a day. What a day. But his response before the king reinforces our focus on evangelism simplified because, listen, the only people that we can win to Christ, listen, are soft sinners. These are the only people that we can win to Christ, soft sinners. Listen, there is always a measure of disappointment, if not regret, when we evangelize and someone says no. There's always a measure of disappointment, right? Like it does hurt. We wonder if, if we presented everything just right or if there's anything that we could have said or done that, that would have been more compelling for them to say yes to the terms of the gospel. But here's what we got to understand. A soft heart is required for salvation. A soft heart is required for salvation. I mean, like, if you don't have that, like, how does someone get saved with a hard heart? They can't. Look at Acts 9, 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, 
and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So Saul was in the synagogue, which was his custom, confounding the Jews. That is, he, he, he took the arguments that they had against Christ as the Messiah and threw them in disorder. He dismantled them. I mean, when they were sitting there like, man, this, what do you say? He's just destroyed our arguments. And the Bible goes on to tell you that he proved that Jesus, in fact, was the Messiah. He proved it. So listen, you're not going to do any better than that. We're talking about Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul. Master debater. Could not have presented the terms any better. I mean, you could teach a class based on what he did, but what was their response? They took counsel to kill him. It wasn't that he presented it wrong. It wasn't that he wasn't eloquent enough. It wasn't that he didn't know enough. It was that their hearts were just stone. They were stone. Even in showing people the kindness of God, they will still harden their hearts toward the gospel. This is why this kindness that we show, it's got to come from a pure place. It can't be, well, I was kind to you, and now you're going to say no? Forget you. No. No. No, we're, we're going to be kind. There are no strings attached here. The only thing that we can ask for is an opportunity to share the gospel. That's it. But as much as we are asking the Lord for opportunities to show this kindness to the lost, Here's what we also have to ask for. We must also ask the Lord to help the lost see their desperate need for him. This is one of the things that over the years I have recognized about myself. It's a misstep in evangelism in that I put too much focus on me. My presentation making sure that I do everything that I'm supposed to do, make sure I'm ready for their objections and all this, that, and the other. I hear that. But ultimately, the biggest thing you want to do is be praying for God to prepare the sinner to encounter you. That in that moment, that God would open their eyes, that God would touch their heart where they can see, oh, wait a minute, I, I'm in trouble. I've got a problem. I desperately need him. Right? No one's getting saved without them recognizing they desperately need to. That was my story. When we examine Mephibosheth's response before the king, we get a visual of what the soft center looks like and is beautiful. And by the way, these things that we're looking at with, with this visual with Mephib Mephibosheth, <laughs> what that say that, I got a little tongue tied there. Uh, this is still applicable to you and me as believers in Jesus Christ. Like we never graduate from these two things we're going to talk about. And and let me tell you, if you want to win in your relationship with God, then this is where you'll stay. This is where I'm going to stay if I want to win in my walk with God. I'm telling you, these two things that we're about to look at in the eyes of God, to him, they're irresistible. It positions God for great glory. Listen, if these two things are not in your life, I promise you, you are grieving the Spirit of God. And so am I. These two things are required for the sinner to be saved. These two things are what you're going to see in a soft sinner. And these two things are what you're going to see in a believer who is walking in a way that is bringing great glory to God. Number one, utter submission. Utter submission. 2 Samuel 9 verse 6 
Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Notice, Mephibosheth prostrated himself. He prostrated himself. He fell on his face and did reverence. He just laid before the king. Utter submission. He humbled himself. Notice, behold, thy servant. There's an exclamation point at the end of that. I'm your servant. Which meant you have the power and you have the right to do to me whatever you choose to do. He's not begging for his life. He, he, he's not trying to make an argument. He's not, he's just... <laughs> utter submission. I keep realizing with God, the way up is always down. You want to win with God? Stay low. There's a phrase in football, you're like, oh, there's another football analogy. I'm sorry. I, I didn't go to Harvard. Um, uh, there's, but, but there's a phrase in football, particularly at, at the line, offensive, defensive line, low man always wins. Low man always wins, right? You, you want to win with God? Be, stay low. Can I just tell you, I have it on very good authority that pride and arrogance are absolutely putrid to God. They are putrid. It is the most nauseating and disgusting fragrance in the nostrils of God. Pride and arrogance. But let me tell you what is very inviting and pleasing. Like walking into my kitchen and my wife's baking cookies. Utter submission. God says, that's a sweet savor. God says, oh, that's wonderful. That's fantastic. You're baking cookies today, right? <laughs> so. But this is consistent with how Saul, later the Apostle Paul, responded to the risen Christ. Acts 9, 4. And he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. The light of Christ brought him to the ground. And what do you see? You see his utter submission to the Lord, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm your servant. Not, Lord, here's what I'd like to do. Oh, Lord, here's what I'm really good at. You know, Lord, I, I mean, you, you know my background. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> no. No demands. No expectations. Because servants don't have those. 
the only expectations that a servant has is what you see right here. I'm a blank sheet of paper. What would you have me to do? That's it. With the best intentions, we try and present the gospel in a compelling way, but listen, listen, listen. To be saved, the sinner must cross the threshold of their pride. They cannot, they will not get saved unless they cross the threshold of their pride. They have to squash that. They have to die to it. They have to humble themselves. And when they do that, you will sense and you will hear a softness that lets you know that they recognize that they're desperate for Him. You'll see it. You'll hear it. They're broken. They're humble. They're soft. They know, I'm in trouble. I need Him. Now, let me just say this. In America... I'm not saying it's impossible, but typically in America, this doesn't happen in one and done conversations. Typically it doesn't. Doesn't. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. Most of the evangelism that I do today is one and done. I I don't work in a, a corporate office anymore. I'm not around lost people like I used to be. So most of my gospel opportunities are, they're one and done. People I'm never going to see again, most likely. And I rarely, if ever, see utter submission. As a matter of fact, most people don't appreciate me cold calling them. Or when they say, have a blessed day. Hey, do you know the Lord? Like, what are you doing? (laughs) No, 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 no. Go, go, go. No, I'm not. (laughs) They're, They're put off. Now, if you take mission trips like Kenya, places like that, you'll see it. You go to some of the third world countries where uh, people don't live in affluence. Yeah, they're desperate and they know it. But in America you are most likely to see utter submission through a series of gospel conversations with someone. Where you're talking with them. There's a relationship. And the more this relationship is continuing, it is dawning on them, I have a problem. Oh, Jesus is not just a nice little story. Wow, I I need him. I need a relationship with him. Or maybe you'll see it in a, maybe they sit through a church service where God has their attention for over an hour. Right? But, but just typically one and done, it, it, you know. Okay. In the time I have left, verse 7. Look at it again. And David said unto him, fear not. Verse 8. And he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant? that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. So to prevent the sons of the former king, the king that is now reigning would have them executed. Why? To, To keep them from trying to retake the kingdom. Mephibosheth, being the grandson of Saul, knew this. He knew it. This is why David said unto him, fear not. Mephibosheth would have been trembling when he prostrated himself before David. He, you could have smelt the fear on him a mile away. But after learning that David was going to show him kindness instead of the sword, notice his response in verse 8. What is thy servant that 
thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am. But we also see in soft sinners this utter unworthiness. Do you understand why I said you don't graduate from these things? Can I tell you when you are in trouble, when I'm in trouble, let me tell you when you are in great trouble with God. Great trouble. It's when you graduate from unworthiness to worthiness. You're in great trouble with God. Great trouble. Mephibosheth knew that he was not worthy of such kindness, mercy, and grace. He knew. Like, I, man, I thought this was going to be my last day. And you're going to do what? We're going to talk more about this. See, the problem that the scribes and the Pharisees had was their unwillingness to embrace their unworthiness. No. They did not appreciate that tone from Jesus to them about them being unworthy. Why? Because they were the big dogs. They were it. They were the religious celebrities. They were the icons of spirituality. Man, they love to walk through the, the streets and then people go, Rabbi, Rabbi, and, and sit in the chief seats. And, and here comes this guy telling me I'm unworthy. There's something wrong with me. What? John 8, 41. Jesus says to, to them, Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father even God. And saying that they weren't born in fornication, they were saying, listen, uh, we, we are of the stock of Israel. That is, we are of pure Jewish blood. We can trace our genealogy all the way back to Abraham. We're not like the Samaritans. We're not a mixed people. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that was in their eyes, that made them worthy. That was the problem with that. That made them worthy and it made them righteous. Mephibosheth was the grandson of the first king of Israel and the son of one of the greatest warriors in Israel's history. But in his eyes, he was a dead dog. who was utterly unworthy. Would you hear this? A worthy sinner will never truly repent. I don't care how kind you are to them. I don't care if you present the gospel to them better than the Apostle Paul did. A worthy sinner will never truly repent. This is why we have to pray. Because it is only God who can bring a person to the point where they recognize that they're a dead dog. Where they recognize their utter unworthiness. So as we close this morning, I want to give you some things to pray about this morning. You can get back into the groups that you were in. Number one, that the Lord would give us as many opportunities uh, to show His kindness to the lost. God, give us many, please. Give us many. That we would present the gospel in truth and in love, and that the Lord would help the sinner to see their desperate need for Him. Can we close this morning that way? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you simplify it for us. Lord, help us to pray right now together from a place of faith. 
and a heart to obey. In Jesus' name.